All right. Welcome, welcome. So we'll let some more friends pop in. So hello everyone, I'm Haley Priest and thank you for joining us today. So today I am joined by my friend and colleague, Frank Santana. Um, we both work at the NAT um, and we're gonna wait a few uh, minutes for folks to finish joining us. But in the meantime, now is a great time to say hello in the chat um, and tell us where you're joining from, your city that you're joining from, maybe even your school. And so, um, hi Frank, how are you today? Doing good. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for tuning in and learning about frogs with us today. Yeah. And so um, we'd like for you guys to know that we cannot see your screens um, and you are muted. So you can access closed captions by joining us live on Facebook and selecting closed captioning. Um, we will be putting some helpful links and information into the chat. Um, and we are recording this and broadcasting to Facebook. Um, and one really important thing is that you can message the panelists, but not each other. Um, so just keep that in mind. So it looks like we have some friends from all over. We have some friends from Solana Ranch in San Diego. Hello to Solana Ranch Elementary. Um, we have some friends from Innovations Academy in Palmdale. Hello to you all. Let's see who else? Ooh, Rancho de la Nacion School in National City. Hello to you all. Yeah, lots of friends from Solana Ranch. <laughs> we have friends from Tijuana and Fred Finch Youth and Family Services. It is great to have you all. So again, just a reminder that we cannot see your screens and you are muted um, and that you guys can message us. So feel free to message the panelists, uh, us with any questions that you have. So it looks like we have a good amount of folks here. So we are gonna do an introductory poll. So our first poll, which you should be seeing on your screen now, um, is have you ever visited a museum before? So have you visited a museum before? Um, and if you wanna let us know maybe what museums you visited, you can let us know in the chat. So it looks like we have a good amount of folks that have visited museums. I see some people in the chat that have been to the NAT, uh, Kennedy Space Center, Indian Museum, San Diego Air and Space Museum. Lots of folks that have been to the museum. So I'm gonna give us maybe 10 more seconds for that chat, for the poll. All right, let's share our results. So we have about 90% of our friends tuning in on Zoom have been to a museum. So that is wonderful. Um, there are a lot of museum visits out there. So uh, we hope that if you guys have not been to the NAT that you will be able to visit us soon. Um, but if you can't visit in person, you can visit our website to see a bit of what our museum is all about and um, get some resources on what the NAT is doing and what our exhibitions are that we have right now. So let's get started. Um, so you guys, we want to, um, again, just for those of you that weren't here in the beginning, um, we want to welcome Frank Santana. So we both work at the NAT um, and Frank is the Herpetology Collections Manager here. Um, so thanks so much for being here, Frank. I'm excited to talk to you about our work with California red-legged frogs. Good morning, everyone. This is Frank. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be here to talk about frogs and we'll learn together and ask some questions. So yeah. Fun. 
Yeah, so um, in your title is a very big word, um, herpetology. Um, so Frank, can you tell us a little bit about what this word means? Sure, herpetology is a study of reptiles and amphibians. And reptiles and amphibians are actually pretty different biologically, but we kind of just lump them together and study both of them. So reptiles are different than amphibians because reptiles have scales. They can um, tolerate being dried out. And amphibians don't have scales, so their skin dries up pretty quickly and they have to live in moist environments. So they're, they're pretty different types of animals, actually. Cool. So you work with a, a wide range of species in your job then. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you do at the museum? Um, so we have some pictures here of some of your work. Um, can you tell us a little bit about these and kind of what a day in your life looks like when you're on the job? Sure. So um, here at the NAT, we have our um, collection projects um, working with these specimens in the museum. We also have field projects where we work outside and do conservation and research projects. Um, so we often go out in the field early in the morning and do our research looking for uh, species that are threatened or endangered, um, monitoring populations of reptiles and amphibians. Um, so sometimes we go down to Baja California, Mexico. So our friends from Tijuana live in Baja California, Mexico, and we go down and do um, surveys for frogs. Um, we do surveys for lizards and snakes. So it's pretty fun. You get to be outside and um, work in a lot of different environments and then think about how those animals survive in their environment and how we can protect them and study their food webs and what other species are there and things like that. Very cool. So it kind of sounds like there isn't really a typical day for you. You kind of do do a lot of everything. <laughs> yeah, we have fun um, projects in the field and we get to do cool research on computers where we do our analyses of data um, and figure out patterns. And the whole time we're kind of thinking about biodiversity. So biodiversity is kind of thinking about all the types of animals that live in the habitat and how we can protect them and keep them um, happy and surviving and doing well. Very cool. All right, so today I'm gonna to be focused on California red-legged frogs. So we have a project where we are working to um, protect the California red-legged frog. And I'm gonna start by um, just talking about, you know, what is this frog all about? You know, what does it do in the environment? Um, and give you kind of some, a basic rundown about the frog. So this is a picture of a California red-legged frog. And they're the largest frog that's found in California, actually. So they're, um, as adult, they can be about five inches when they're kind of sitting like this in this position. Um, but if you were to grab one with your hands, it's, it has these long legs. So when they stretch out, they're actually about twice as long. So if you hold your hand out, there may be about, a small one would be about the size of your hand if you're holding your palm out. And a bigger one would be about twice as big as your wow. palm sitting in your hand. So they can get pretty big. They're also very cute, so. <laughs> yeah, they're really cool creatures. And then they depend on aquatic habitat. So as we talked about earlier, amphibians need to have a wet environment. So you can see here that they have, um, uh, they live in streams or ponds. So they can live in different types of habitat, but there always has to be a reliable source of water for them to be able to survive there. And with those habitat types, the streams versus the ponds, um, what is the biggest difference between those habitats? Yeah, it's a great question. So streams typically have more kind of clear water and they're usually flowing constantly. Um, and then the ponds are kind of like side channels away from the streams where there's water, but it doesn't really flow. So there's not a lot of currents or anything. And where the red-legged frogs live in streams, they live in streams that are not too fast. They're not like really big rivers that are flowing really fast. They're smaller kind of streams that have, um, you know, clear water and good water flow. So they're very adaptable because they can live in ponds, which are oftentimes more kind of like mucky and um, have more algae and things like that growing inside of them. Very cool. And here's another picture of an adult red-legged frog kind of sitting at the edge of the stream. So they, they have to stay moist. So they're often just kind of sitting at the edge of the stream or a pond um, at the edge of the water 
and making sure that their body's in contact with water because if they're not in the water, um, they can dry out quickly. So maybe if it's raining or if it's at night, you know, they're gonna be moving around more away from the water. And they're typically more active nocturnally. So they're active at night. When they, at night, they can hop away from the water and go look for insects that they eat, things like that. So just mentioned that they eat insects. Do you all have any other ideas about what else they might eat? So what would a red-legged frog eat? Okay, yeah, so put your uh, answers in the chat um, if you have any guesses of what else they eat. So I see some friends that think they eat bugs, maybe owls and birds eat them. So even going a little deeper to what might eat them. Um, yeah. I see a lot of answers for flies, a lot of answers for insects, maybe even small fish or flowers or water plants. A lot of answers for bugs. <laughs> We've got a yeah. consensus on the bugs in here. Yeah. So for what they eat, they're actually carnivores, right? So they eat other living organisms that are animals. And so they don't eat plants when they're adults, but um, we'll talk about life stages in a second. And then um, also thinking about what eats them. So I think some people mentioned that birds would eat them. And yeah, that's a great, great thing to think about. And when we think about one species, they're really part of a complex like food web. So let's think about the food web here. I kind of put this diagram together that can show us um, a food web showing that they play an important role in the ecosystem. The whole system is very complicated and the frogs eat insects as a lot of you were saying, flies, mosquitoes, um, they'll eat moths, um, but other things will eat them too. So uh, a raccoon could eat them, a uh, bird could eat them, snakes could eat them. Um, but we're also kind of thinking about with amphibians, a lot of them go through a metamorphosis and they have a complex stage, right? So complex life history. So I also have a tadpole here. The tadpoles are herbivores and they eat plants. So they do eat plants when they're young and they're um, in the tadpole stage before they turn into frogs. Um, so it's a really, um, red-legged frog plays an important role in all types of ecosystems. Yeah, um, very interesting. Stages. We did have one question um, asking if they were poisonous. So are they poisonous, Frank? No, red-legged frogs are not poisonous, but they probably don't taste very good. So <laughs> when you when you pick them up, they when they're feeling stressed out, they think you're a predator as a human. And if you go and pick them up, they have a weird smell. It kind of smells like if someone was burning the, the tires, burning their tires, and it kind of has a weird chemical smell, kind of like burnt chemicals, they produce this um, secretion over their whole body so that if something were to, you know, try to put them in their mouth, they might spit it out because it tastes kind of yucky. Um, so not really poisonous, but they don't taste very good. It's a great question. Yeah. Okay, so they're important in the food web. And then let's think more about the biology of just the, the red-legged frogs. So here we have two red-legged frogs that are held together. And they do this during the breeding season when they're getting together to have babies. And this happens during the winter. So in the winter, when the pools and the streams fill up with more water, the males um, or the boys, right, they, they tr call and try to attract the females. And when they find a female, they hold on to them for a couple of days. And then um, if it goes well, if the female or the girl likes them enough, she will lay a clutch of eggs. So you can see here, these eggs are really cool looking, right? They're like these little, they look like little tapioca balls if you've ever had boba, right? They, they kind of have that gelatin, but you can see here, they have this clear outer uh, layer. And then inside there is the, the developing embryo. So that will turn into um, a tadpole as it keeps growing and growing and growing. And they can lay up to 2000 eggs at a time. So these eggs, and the whole mass of eggs, of these 2,000 eggs, they can be like the size of a small cantaloupe. Sometimes they're smaller, more like a grapefruit, depending on the size of the, the female. But it's pretty cool to um, hike around and find these egg masses. And, and we study these egg masses to understand how healthy the population of red-legged frogs is. That's pretty crazy that they lay, you know, hundreds or even close to 1,000 eggs in one mass. That's a lot of babies. Mm-hmm. 
and they have to produce so many babies because there's a lot of things that can eat them. So they, they make a lot of them. And you can see here after the eggs hatch out, this is a really kind of cool, weird picture. It looks like we're looking under a microscope, but it's not. This is, look, you can see this with your naked eye. And we used a camera underwater and you can see these are little tadpoles that just hatched out and they're feeding on the outside of their egg masses. So there's some green stuff growing and they're herbivores at this stage. So they're eating the plants that are growing underwater here. Very cool. And as they get a little bit bigger, they start moving around more and then eventually um, they will stay as tadpoles for maybe like four months and then they metamorphose into um, small, small frogs. Very cool. So during this process, the males will make a noise to try to attract the females. They call out. So they call out and they say, you know, they make their call and they attract the females so that they can get together and make babies. Um, so I'm going to play some calls for you, some noises. So if you want to listen to your speakers, you know, so that you can hear very well, um, I'm going to play a few calls and I want you to tell me, just go ahead and guess which one you think is the California legged frog. Okay, here we go. That's the first one. Now we're gonna do the second one here. All right, so we've heard call one and call two, so let's hear the last one. Last and one. then you guys can make your guess on the poll. All right, so go ahead. Do you think it was the first call that we played that's the red-legged frog, the second call? or the third call. And if you don't have access to the polling feature, you can always uh, type it in the chat. Um, we can play them one more time. So let's go ahead and play call one. At least a section of it. So that's call one. All right, and call two. So that is call two, and then call number three. All right, so we'll give you about 10 more seconds to put your answers in either the poll or into the chat. And we'll see what the answer is in just a moment. So the question is, which of these calls do you think is from a California red-legged frog? All right, so we are going to share our results. So we have about half of you guys that think the first call is the red-legged frog. About 40% of our friends think call two is the red-legged frog and about 8% think that call number three was the red-legged frog. So Frank, do you want to share the answer? Sure, let me play the one that's actually the red-legged frog. So we'll play it. So that's it, the second one actually. So those so, of you that answered call two are correct. And you can see it's kind of a quiet call, right? So they're not really loud. Um, amphibians uh, or frogs, you know, they 
have very, very different sounds because if they're all sounding the same, they would think they're the same species. So they all have different unique sounds. And people often think that they all have one type of call, but frogs can sometimes sound really weird. They make these high pitched noises. But the California red-legged frogs have a more quiet call. And I'll show you all on a video really quick what it looks like when they make that call. So here we go, a quick video of, of a male frog calling to try to attack females. So you can see that those vocal sacs come out from the sides as the male's making that call. And then you probably heard some other frogs that are more typical sounding frogs in the background. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the California red-legged frog, what it does in the environment, how it survives, what it needs. Now let's jump into um, why we're studying it. So the California red-legged frog, you can see on this map, um, used to occur in all these green areas on this map, or it, it, right now it occurs in only in the green areas on the map. It used to occur in the whole gray area. So it's not found in all the places where it used to be. And let's think about what are some reasons why it's not found in all those areas anymore. Any ideas about why it's threatened, why it's not found where it used to be? So if you have any ideas of maybe what made the red-legged frog not be found where it used to be found, I see migration, loss of habitat, pollution, global warming, too many predators, a lot of, a lot of loss of habitat, loss of resources, so we got a lot of people, people chatting in some Great. good answers. Those are all good ideas. So someone said more predators, um, predators that are not supposed to be here are now here. Like bullfrogs are about twice as big and they eat the California red-legged frog. So that's a problem invasive species. Loss of habitat. So when you convert areas that had water and you remove the water um, and you take away the wetlands for the frogs and they can't survive there anymore. Pollution into waterways changing the way we um, have dams and building things that uh, eliminate waterways that used to have frogs and then diseases are another problem. So we can address some of these problems though. So this, it's not hopeless. We have some hope that we can fix the habitats and that's what we're working on is to um, work in areas where we can identify the things that have caused the declines and then um, address them. So. Here at the NAT, we're working on a project where we are collecting egg masses from Mexico, from Baja California, Mexico, and moving them to the United States back to San Diego and Riverside County. And we were able to remove the invasive species from those sites and we were able to harvest those eggs. So part of my job is to go out and look for these eggs and we work on a team. Everything we do is working collaboratively, collaboratively as a team, right? So. When I was in school, I was kind of shy and I didn't like working on teams with other people, but uh, working on a team is really important and it's really fun actually once you kind of figure out your team that you like to work with. So we go out and we look for egg masses out there in the streams. And then we find an egg mass. If it's a, a good egg mass, we can collect it and move it from Mexico. And then we drive it across the border. It takes like a like eight hours to get from where we are in Mexico. We put them in a cooler and drive them across eight hours and we have special paperwork and things like that. And we move them to a couple of ponds in Southern California here um, where we have removed invasive predators and we've made it a really good habitat again and uh, released the eggs there. And here are some pictures of some of the great egg masses that we see when we're out there looking for them. Really, really cool to take pictures of. Yeah, and so you said that word invasive a few times. Can you tell us what that means? Yeah, so an invasive species is a species that's not supposed to be where it is. So um, if someone brought it here as a pet, maybe they released it, or people for the bullfrogs, which are the main 
problem for invasive species for the red-legged frog. People brought them here so that they could eat them because frogs, these frogs are bigger, they have like meat on their legs. So they would just release them into the local water. And now it's a problem because they're all over the place really. So it takes a lot of work to get rid of the bullfrogs once they're here. They're in golf courses, they're in natural streams, they're in man-made lakes. So bullfrogs are a big problem. And um, another example invasive species is um, if you have a pet cat, if any of you have ever had pet cats, sometimes pet cats get out and they start their own population and they're roaming around. They're not normally gonna be out in the wild, but there's wild populations of pet cats. Thanks, Frank. You're welcome. And here's some more pictures of egg masses. Sometimes they can be hard to find. So I wanna show you this picture. Uh, let's see if you can find where the egg mass is in this pond. So let us know in the chat once you find where the egg mass is. And if you can imagine walking around by streams and ponds and trying to spot this in the water. And you also don't want to step on it, right, Frank? Because you want to make sure that it stays nice and safe. So they're let's really see. fragile. Yeah, it looks like a lot of our folks are saying that they can spot it. Some people are saying in the middle, some people are saying at the bottom left. There it is. So there it is. Good job spotting it. It can be yeah. really hard to see them, especially when it's a little bit cloudy. Everything looks kind of dark and black and we're trying to avoid them. So when we find an egg mass, we measure it. We look at to make sure it's healthy. Uh, we put a flag there to note where it is. And then we go back um, a couple of weeks later and, and make sure it's still doing well before it hatches out. And then for the ones that we do harvest, we release them in these holding pens. Um, any ideas about why we would put the eggs in a holding pen before we release them into the pond? So if you have any ideas of why we maybe would put the eggs into a holding pen before releasing them into the ponds that we're putting them in. We have a few friends saying, so no predators eat them so that they can grow up healthy so we don't lose any. That's exactly it, so that we can protect them from predators. There's uh, insects in the water that could get them. There's snakes in the water that could get them. And then we can also keep an eye on them. So we usually hold them for a couple months. And then it's their big graduation day. Here's a video of us releasing them. We can go underwater in a second, show you what it looks like when they're big and healthy, then they can swim off, and have a better chance of surviving. Look at all of them. Some of them have little back legs. It's pretty awesome. And then we are finding that after we release them, so we've been working on this project for three years, they are surviving. And so we are getting some um, frogs that are uh, turning from tadpoles and metamorphosing into frogs and surviving. So it's, it's cool. been three years and we're going to keep working on this project. and. Um, that's the end of the story for now, but stay tuned. Very, very cool. Wow, Frank, uh, this definitely has been very cool. Uh, and I've already seen a lot of questions coming in through the chat. Um, so this is your time, um, all of our viewers, to, to send in your questions. Um, and I will be asking some of those to Frank. So let me pull up some of the questions we've had so far. Um, so Carissa asks, how can they be endangered if they lay so many eggs, Frank? That's a great question. So they lay a lot of eggs, but uh, we talked about the food web, right? So these eggs hatch into really, really small tadpoles and there's a lot, a lot of things that will eat them. So um, dragonfly babies will eat them. Um, snakes will eat them. Fish will eat them. There's so, so many things. So out of all these um, eggs, maybe one or two out of a hundred will survive to become a frog. Wow, so they have to lay so many because a very, very small percentage of those will actually become full grown adult frogs, right? Yeah, exactly. Great question. Yeah, that was a really good question. Um, 
So Alexander asks, can't other frogs understand what the call is saying that the red-legged frog is giving? That's a um, situation where we think that they don't understand to the point they know that it's not their own species. So okay. They'll recognize that's not what I'm listening for. That doesn't really get them excited and interested. So they know that they're different. Um, and they only really focus on the ones that sound like their type of species. Cool. Uh, we have a question from Max asking, where do we find the egg masses or find the frogs? So if you were in, if you're living in California or in Baja, California, there's only 10 populations in Baja, California that we know of. And then in Southern California, in our area, there's only the two that we did reintroduction. So, um, you won't likely find them unless you know exactly where to go, but they lay their eggs in streams and pond habitats. And that's a cool question because thinking about, if you look at some of these photos, they attach their eggs to like sticks and branches of things. They always have to have it attached to something. And it's usually not that deep. They don't do it in the very, very deepest part of the water, but more shallow. Yeah, very cool. Um, another question about um, when we're moving the egg masses, um, how do we make sure, how do you make sure that the eggs don't break apart? That's hard. We actually physically take about half of each egg mass. So when we're collecting them, we don't take the whole thing. We just, we use our fingers and kind of pull them apart in half so that half of them can stay where they originally were. So we don't take okay. all the eggs. So we can leave some for their home where they came from originally and then we move them over. And the sooner you find the egg mass after it's been laid, when the eggs are still developing early, they stick together really well, so they don't really fall apart. But if you wait too long, they'll start to fall apart and then you can lose some of them. So we try to get them early on. It's a good question. Very good. Um, we have another question about um, where these guys can be found and if they can be found or if they can live in salt water. So they're found in streams and freshwater habitat only, streams and ponds and lakes. And they're found closer to the, the coastal areas actually. Well, they can be up in the mountains too, but they're, they're, not, um, they're not in deserts um, anymore. They're mostly found closer to the coast. Very good. Um, we have a question I think from Eddie. Um, how long does it take for the eggs to hatch after they are laid? So it depends on temperature, but it's about two to three weeks. In areas where it's a little bit warmer, if it's a lower elevation, they'll develop more quickly. And if it's a little bit colder, there's some sites where they're higher up in the mountains and it, it stays cold for a lot longer. It could take maybe up to four weeks if it's a lot colder. Yeah, so that must mean that you guys have to get out there to translocate some of those eggs pretty quickly after they're laid. Yeah, we go out during the um, season when it's the winter is when they lay their eggs. Um, we go out week after week after week, one week between visits. Okay, cool. Um, we had someone asking, uh, Eleanor asking about how many people help to move the frogs. So maybe a little bit about the different people that are involved when you translocate. Yeah, it took about 10 people maybe working in Mexico together collaborating and everything, and then 10 people in the United States. So it's, it's a good amount of people working to make sure everything's working well. Very cool. Um, Andy asks, how do you know that they are not bullfrog eggs that you're collecting? Yeah, that's a good question. So bullfrogs, if they are living in the same areas, their egg masses are a lot bigger. So these ones have egg masses um, that are smaller. Uh, bullfrogs will be about twice as many eggs. So we can tell them pretty easily that way. Very cool. All right, we have time for maybe a few more questions. Um, Ronald asks, um, are these frogs warm or cold-blooded? These frogs are cold-blooded. So cold-blooded is the idea that they are the same temperature as their environment. Um, so, and amphibians and reptiles are both cold, what we would call cold-blooded. 
but they can warm up right so they can sit in the sun and they can actually get their blood to be pretty warm temperatures but they're similar to their environment very very close to their environmental temperatures all right uh may may asks um do the parent frogs the mom and the dad frogs leave the eggs after they are laid or do they take care of them yeah they don't take care of the eggs they just um Let's see if I can go back to a picture of them together. After the female lays the eggs, then she just attaches them to a stick or um, uh, some other surface where they'll stay and she leaves. They don't take care of them after. So they're on their own once they are laid. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I think our last question for today um, is going to be um from looks like it's from ollie um and ollie asks uh can the frogs be taken to an enclosure or can they be you know i know there's other species that are have captive breeding programs so is there a reason why we don't do that with these guys yeah so with these frogs we're trying to um keep it as simple as possible so that we can um have more resources to focus on field visits and really studying the frogs in the wild. So we keep them in these enclosures, these pens out in the wild, but we don't keep them permanently inside. And that's just to, um, uh, our strategy right now is to try to do it with as little time of holding them in cages as possible. But in the future, if the populations start doing worse and worse, there's strategies in conservation where you take animals into captivity and have, have them there so that you can uh, make sure they don't go extinct. But right now it's not that bad, luckily. Very cool. So it looks like actually we might have a uh, time for a few more questions and we have a few more coming through. So we'll try and um, get to our last few questions. Um, someone asks, what are the eggs made of? That's a really good question because those egg masses are so big, right? So if the egg mass is that big, it's bigger than the frog itself. And so when the eggs are inside of the female's body, they're compact, really, really compact. And it's kind of like when you add water to a jello mix, right? What happens when you add water to a jello mix and you put it in the fridge? It starts to expand and get bigger and bigger. When the female lays her eggs, they're really tight. And then they hit the water outside of her body and they start to swell up and they make that kind of, let me show you all a picture you can see where they kind of make these um, bubbles, right? So the outer bubble is actually filled up with water from the, from the environment that they're laid in. Um, so it's just kind of like proteins and other molecules that have that protective bubble on the outside. And the, the dark spot in the middle, that's the embryo where the sperm and the egg come together and then it produces and grows and grows and grows into multiple cells. Very cool. So even though the mom and the dad don't stick around to help take care of the eggs, they kind of try and give them their best, their best chance by, by protecting them when they lay them. So mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. Um, so we have a question from Henry um, asking, do the frogs move around during the daytime or at nighttime? So it's kind of interesting. It's kind of like, you know, when, as we grow up, you know, our, we change when we're younger versus being adults. When they're young frogs, they're usually active more during the daytime when they're young. And sometimes you'll see an adult out during the day, but they're mostly nocturnal. So the adults are mostly nocturnal. The adults are only out at night. Very cool. Um, Sophie asks, um, how high can these guys jump or how far can they jump? Uh, they could jump maybe like two feet, not that far, actually. So the jumping, though, is like if, if this, you imagine this frog in the picture here, if a snake came up behind it, it could jump far enough to jump into a deep part of the water. So maybe two or three feet. So enough to keep it safe. <laughs> mm hmm. Um, we have a question from Justin. Justin asks, um, do humans hunt these frogs? Humans don't hunt these frogs, but in the past they used to. So we talked about how bullfrogs were brought to California um, and mostly for food. 
the people that were um, during the gold rush, a lot of people came to California to look for gold and the frogs were, these red-legged frogs were pretty easy to catch. And so they would eat the red-legged frogs for food. But then they started eating all of them and there were no more. So they brought the bullfrogs in to replace them and they're bigger and things like that. So people used to eat them for food, yeah. Very cool. So we have time for about three more questions. So we have a question um, from Michael and I saw another question regarding this. Um, do these guys, do they breathe air? Can they breathe water? What is their, uh, the way that they get oxygen? Amphibians actually have a superpower where they can breathe through their skin and they breathe air. They can breathe through the skin inside their throat if they, when they kind of like pump air in and out into their throat. So their whole body is like a giant lung and they can breathe through their skin and get oxygen through the air, through their skin. And then, um, so they, they can't breathe underwater, but they, uh, so they have to breathe air, um, but they can breathe through their skin. And they also can breathe into their lungs. They have lungs as well, just like us. So they're pretty amazing that way. Yeah, they, they are definitely a very unique animal. Um, so Shreya asks, what is the biggest amount of eggs that you have found? I don't know if that means in one, um, egg mass or in total so you can you can answer that however you like yeah so that one we aren't exactly sure we measure them and they can get maybe the size of like a, a cantaloupe I think is probably the biggest one that we found and one thing that we were struggling with and maybe you all have some ideas or you can think about this is how would we count the number of eggs in a mass right if you look at this picture it's hard to count them all and make sure you're not double counting them or missing them. And if, unless you plucked each one of them, then you would, you would damage them and they would probably not survive. So we're trying to figure out a way actually how to count them without damaging them. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, that is a very good question. So do you guys have any, any ideas? Let us know of how we can maybe better count these, these egg masses. All right, so our last question, which maybe is one that a lot of people have, because I, I feel like you probably get asked this a lot, Frank. Uh, how far does their tongue extend? Because we see in cartoons, right, their tongues go really far out. But for these guys, how far does their tongue extend? Their tongue doesn't extend that far, but what's cool about, so their tongue maybe extends like the size of their head, and that's it, you know, just the, where their head with their eyes are. So it kind of just flops out. But what's cool is that their tongue is attached to the front of their mouth. So if you imagine, stick your tongue out. Uh, imagine if your tongue was coming out from the front, like by your lip and it flipped out. So it kind of flips out like a trap. So it's pretty cool. They can flip it out and they suck whatever was on top of that in. Um, so they don't flick it really far. That's more like a chameleon that really does that, like a lizard. The chameleon lizard can do a really long tongue flick and some salamanders, but Frogs don't really um, extend their tongue really far, but if you go on YouTube and look up frog tongue, you'll see it, it flops out in kind of like a weird way where it's attached to the front, it just folds out and then it pops back in. Very, very cool. All right, Frank. Well, I know you had a few things about how we as the public and how our viewers can kind of maybe help the red-legged frog. Um, so thank you everyone for all of your great questions. But now let's kind of talk about maybe some solutions or ways that we can help these guys. Yeah, so the first thing I wanna share is just thinking about not letting your um, pets loose, right? So if you look at this here, um, if you have any pets, just keep them inside and don't let them go. Especially if you have pet lizards, frogs, snakes, fish don't release them if you don't want it anymore um, you have to find someone else who can take it um, but don't let them out in the wild um, same with things like um, cats and other wildlife if you can keep them inside then they won't um, attack native animals and we talked about some other threats the red-legged frogs another one is thinking about climate change and climate change is a really big problem and global warming um, but things you can do maybe if you want to ride your bike to school if you have a bike or you can walk to school if it's close enough. Um, encourage your parents to maybe say, let's, let's ride our bikes to the grocery store today instead of driving in a car. Because every time we get in a car, if it's powered by gas, it contributes to climate change. And you can also um, 
every little bit helps that way. And the third thing I thought of was to um, think about going on hikes more. So going on hikes and experiencing nature, even if it's a little canyon or something like that, you can go out and experience nature and I think it'll help you appreciate and really care for the things that we see in the natural environment. And then lastly, if some of you are a little bit older, um, and even if you're not, you know, any students who want to, um, let's get rid of this annotation, um, clear, undo. Um, you can become an activist with organizations that care about protecting our environment. There's different organizations in San Diego where you can volunteer at places here, like at the NAT. Um, so getting involved and talking about the things you care about with, with adults and with other people is a good way to really get people to um, protect the environment. Very cool. Well, um, a huge thank you to um, our special guest, Frank, for joining us and teaching us a lot about red-legged frogs. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. So um, we're going to put a few things in the chat. Um, educators, make sure you check out our Baja California Learning Resources um, by visiting our website. Um, and then you can also view this recording on the Nats Live program page. Um, and please join us for our next Baja story, um, which is on Friday, November 18th at 10 a.m. Um, and the title of that one is Rats, a Rediscovery Tale, where we will be talking about um, the kangaroo rat and some very interesting things about our research there. So you can RSVP um, on our website. Um, and until then, we would love to see you at the San Diego Natural History Museum. So come and visit us. Thank you all for joining us. Bye, have a great day. <laughs>